podcast listeners. If you hear my voice right now, I need you to do something for me. I want you to take out your phone or on your computer, go to Apple Podcasts, search for Ask Your Old Head Podcast. You'll see my, my logo, my little picture, my little image there. Find the show. Please rate and write a review. It's a small thing, but it helps others find this work and find what I'm doing here. And it really, really matters, uh, as small as that may seem. So if you could please do that uh, before we get into the show, I very much appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Let's get into it. Peace. Yo, before we get into this episode, uh, just want to say thank you for staying, 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 staying with me and Ash Old Head Podcast Creative Experience. Um, please take the best part and more to come as we get into the summer. So, peace. Peace. I'm just My brother, Justice Raji. Man, so, um, it's been a minute, but, uh. So among them, all the interesting and, and things that have occurred, I, I think something intriguing. Uh, I'm curious uh, your thoughts on it. Is 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 the submarine uh, implosion? And I mean, there's a lot of different layers of engagement with this. From um, you know, people spending a lot of money to go do something wildly dangerous, uh, with some indications that the person running it maybe it was a little over over uh overconfident skis, right <laughs> in their capacity to you know you could we could we could look at the angle of the i mean juxtapose the 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 media coverage of their plight versus the the the, the ship of 700 people um that sunk in the straits in, in Greece that you know did get mentioned but it was sort of like you know in and out the news cycle at the same time, whilst whilst the the coverage and the search and the you know what's going to happen to these folks going going underwater to see a wreck um, and ending up unfortunately losing their lives, um, I mean, it just because it's, it's nothing happy about people losing their lives. I mean, you know, regardless how I feel about the circumstances that got them there, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious, like you know, like so yeah, man. Let me. So it, here's the first thing. I want to say this to everyone, you know, I may come off as a Scrooge for saying this, but it won't be the first time. <laughs> everything in a damn me, man. Yeah. You know, it, it just like everything is not newsworthy. We're in some ways. I don't know how newsworthy this was, frankly. Mm-hmm. Everything's not a meme either. Like we have to be really careful with trivialization that comes from memification. I don't know if I just made that up, but. If I did, it might, but that's cool. Cool. But like, everything's not a meme. And so here's my thing. If five people with what some consider a lot of money or too much money or not too much time wanted to go try a largely unproven methodology, largely unproven, but but exciting methodology (laughs) of getting down somewhere. You know what? Fuck it, man. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know what I mean? I, it, it's when this is when we start this whole like counting people's money, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Number one, you know, I'm a guy who likes to stay on the surface, so I think people do to me unsafe shit all the time. <laughs> like, <is laughs> they was, the fact that they was in a boat, and the fact that they was in a boat at all, you like, man, what y'all doing in that boat? Man, listen, for me, it was, why was y'all out there? I'm going to start be like, oh, why, why was y'all even out there? <laughs> That's like when people start being in water and out places where it might be sharks and shit. Because like, the water's blue. Like, yo. So, I mean, there's a daredevilification of culture, I think, just mm-hmm. general, right? There are times people go on safaris, quote unquote, which is like, besides the fact that you've kind of made the animals uh, unresponsive and kind of, you know, to the fact that their land is being intruded upon, that shit's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So for me, like, it's just levels of danger now. You know, like Rick Roll said, am I going uh, Am I going somewhere deeper than the whales is? Nah. That's just me, though. 
I'm not going to where deeper with whales is, man. <laughs> like they supposed to be there. I'm not right. That's okay. This ain't Aquaman. That's That's but I, but I, <laughs> but I do think it's kind of like I think we live in a culture of varying degrees of like that kind of stuff. Now, yeah. and I'm sure you'll elaborate deeply on this second point. <laughs> Obviously, the juxtaposition of a, a you know a refugee tanker. Was, was, was it was it was it was a it was like a fishing ship that was loaded with you know uh, migrants you know what I'm saying migrants. trying to oh. trying to get get to get to get over to Europe somewhere get to Europe Greece. right right get to Greece so I think also one of the challenges with the memes is this happened but you don't care about this well the other thing is do you know why there was a fishing boat with seven hundred people on it trying to get to Greece. A country, frankly, that's not really known to be the most inviting to black folks. Well, yeah, not or any whoever. Yeah, right? like they they're not really on some open borders type time. And for folks who you know may not know, just you know, uh, elected a pretty far right prime minister and president. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole bunch of other factors around it other than just rich people died this way, but 700 Africans died this way, but y'all don't care. Because the reality of is Africans dying, if not every day, on a consistent basis, trying to get across these streets because of the condition, the economic conditions in Africa, some of which are perpetuated by behaviors in America. Mm-hmm. Some of which are perpetuated by foreign policy in America. That we may be complicit in. So again, maybe I'm a screw here too. But okay. well, I mean, I, I just think we, I just think we sometimes can't use these. Like we get into the memification of stuff. Like care about this, don't care about this. People's priorities is messed up. But these are two different. These are two entirely different situations. And the only bond is there's something to still do with our economic and fun- and political dysfunctional systems that might produce outcomes of both of them. In a sense that somebody wants to go deeper than whales or, you know, you're talking about a fishing tanker, but also not talking about, frankly, migrants trying to get to America from Haiti. Mm -hmm. So it's cool to say to talk about what's happening, you know, not cool, but it's one thing you want to you want to strike a blow against white supremacy um, and the unfairness of of white supremacy when people down a tanker, but not thinking about. America's foreign policy against Haiti in this hemisphere. Yeah. And what it means when migrant or the borders, or when people make jokes about the borders, right? And people are coming all the way from Venezuela or people coming from all across South America in the Southern Hemisphere to get to American borders, which is the same thing. Mm-hmm. But if you don't make those connections, then it just seems like honestly, you're playing with it. You, you, like you're playing around, so yeah, I'm also. Awesome. Well, thank you. You know, the thing I, I, I guess, like, it's like if people want to do something that doesn't seem like the best thing to do, you know, you know, I it's the only place where every once in a while, you know, that I would say like my libertarian brothers and sisters, you know, we might might agree. It's sort of like if you want to do something that seems really risky and unnecessary, but you got the means to do it. I ain't saying you should, and I hope you'd be okay, but I'm also going to respect the idea that that's what you really wanted to do. And, Absolutely. and you know, I mean, we could have a discussion about public resources, you know, being used to try to find you and all that sort of thing, which, you know, is a valid conversation, right, to, to be talked about. I mean, I, I don't think we have um, my own, you know, you know, Raji moral compass would be like, if I was a Coast Guard dude, even if I didn't think you were supposed to be out there, I would go out there to try to save you because that's what I do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like that's what I do. Like I'm, I'm a Coast Guard person. Like I go and try to get people and be safe from being stranded at sea. But, and it's, but that's the premise. Like doing is doing something dumb a reason you shouldn't be helped if you was driving if you was driving too fast. Is that a reason we shouldn't pull you out of the car via the accident? Yeah, right. So see, that's what I'm saying. So like you know, I I I feel for. The you know, if you, if something's the right thing to do, and you operate in the world of doing the right thing, you do the right thing. 
because because like the other side of sort of uh there's like a, a criticizing the um the persons who spent these resources and you know almost the implication that like we should stop them from doing silly stuff with their money which I mean, might be, a, I don't, you know, I don't know the right angle to engage in that. And then at what level does people doing silly stuff with their right, with their own money require public intervention? It starts to get tricky. Like you start thinking about it. So it's sort of like, look, now, now I definitely feel that there's space because I do think the, the construction of the idea and people who go like, you know, something is getting, you know, in the way of innovation. And all I could think was innovation and doing submarines feels like, you know, it feels like submarine science. It's probably pretty. I think it's what it seems like one of those things is okay to be a little bit on the uh, on the cautious side. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I, and then well, my thing but, is, but there's a conversation there, even of like, you know, again in America and increasingly all over the world, innovation kind of starts in the private sector. I mean, the public sector, frankly, and then eventually, you know, it, it gets privatized. Yeah. Like whether by funding or whatever. So my point about that is like, okay, all right, they wanted to try to innovate and you know, it probably could have been left back up to people who spent a lot of money and time on the thing. But at the same time, there's a lot of people who like, oh man, this is new shit going on. Let me try this. <laughs> right. I like guess, this- yeah. I guess my thought is this though, is that like if if folks because this is clearly this is a this is a market for fabulously wealthy people. This isn't a market for like I saved, I, I I took my tax return and some other things I saved together and I'm gonna take my four or five G's and go on a nice vacation. This is a you know, people paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So my thing is if I'd pay two fifty, I'd probably pay four fifty if I knew I was totally a hundred percent likely to come back alive. Just yes, sir. You're correct. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So from a you know, I reach out to the economists in the building. Like what the price? <laughs> what's the where the price and the risk on the same page, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, why are people who have the means putting themselves in in, in jeopardy for in this way? You know, and I, and apparently a lot of other other people. I don't know a lot of people, but other people have done this dive. You know, with these folks before, before this one ended in catastrophe, um, and to you know. You know, I guess the fact that they came back means that, well, most of the time, the thing they built worked. But I just, I, I think we get into this and just looking at it from a public phenomenon that we want to talk about because we think about it as, like, evidence that, like, people with lots of money don't know what to do with it. And that they're, like, you know, you know, uh, you know starving children in, a, in, in, a, in an American city somewhere and you getting in a boat for $250,000, you know, which... I got evidence that people with not a lot of money don't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm being somewhat <laughs> facetious. But I, I think, again, it's the psychology of the idea about money, intelligence, risk tolerance, mm-hmm. com, quote unquote, common sense. Right, you know the the, the 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 thing in our families and our communities where the assumption is if you got too much money to be to be thinking dumb mm-hmm. <laughs> or too much money to be taking risks, and and I know, think we we re- uh, revisited that conversation in some recent discussions about an individual. Exactly, That's and it doesn't it doesn't mean that, right? right. Like, <laughs> I mean, the sociological studies show that, psychology shows that. There's a whole bunch of stuff in our in our country again, like. We think about a lot of the chances that people take with money Mm -hmm. that on the curve might be like a lot of decisions that people make without money for different for for not the same reasons, but some of the similar outcomes. So, you know, again, I think the submarine is kind of like the ice bath. We constantly have these interesting social experiments, Mm -hmm. one that it gets presented to us. Two, how it gets presented to us. Three, what it is juxtaposed with. And then four, especially with social media, how we start to discuss it and what are the underpinnings of 
of what we're discussing and why. And then it also, I'll, I'll just add this, it shows that how much we, you know, this is, you, know, you ain't got to read the Rob report to know this, but yeah, people take chances with their money, you know, and, mm-hmm. and just as, you know, you might want to be the, the freshest, you know, coming into the club and you might want to be the person with the most interesting shoes on. Sometimes with money, it's the same principle. It just means you went and did some crazy shit that other people didn't do. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line of being recognized and standing out is the same. It's just a scale of resources. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, I think it's just fascinating the way when something like this happens, it's like, like it, it, if even though you don't know it right now, someone with a lot of money is spending money on something that you think is absolutely ridiculous, but you have, but you don't know about it. So therefore, you know, you're not upset and they didn't, you know, die underwater, but there's somewhere spending a whole lot of money on something that's like, really spending money on that. Maybe you should do something better. But I, I think it's a, um, I don't know if there's any extra deep redeemable lesson <laughs> here. I just think it's uh, the outside, I think, for me, which is always my lesson with what we uh, equate to news is like, is whatever you're spending time tracking, is it actually worth your time? Like, is it is, is knowing what's happening with it? Is is it is it is it the best use of your time? Right. Like, you know, there's a whole lot of other stuff happening, you know. You know, from the Supreme Court to, uh, you know, uh, shoot, uh, in Oregon, the closing of the, the long session, there's all kinds of stuff cracking off. Like, you know, maybe high focus on what's happening or, or you know, how I don't know. And again, I don't know how much energy anyone puts into any of these things, but you could get the sense when something is trending in, in social media and then flows into the rest of media that it is the paramount issue of the public. Right. And then and of course, you automatically get somebody saying it's a distraction. From some other nefarious thing, and then you, you even had, I think some. Oh yeah, that, this 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 one was either the the migrant boat, which I just don't think it was a distraction from the migrant boat. Frankly, I think it was just or, coincidence. Yeah, yeah, or it was just, or it was the uh, the you you know USDA or the FDA. I think it was the FDA. Actually, pardon me, the FDA just passed lab grown and cultivated meat. Yeah, so that's why they try to keep your eyes on that submarine and over here. And it's like so you right. right. Or or you just would know that this is something that was coming for a long time. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you it trust me, this stuff ain't pulled over your eyes. Because yeah. when it when they say cultivated meat, there's still gonna be people who eat the chicken breast. Just like when they introduced genetically modified you know, GMO stuff. And then now, basically, the only way you know it's not GMO is if it tells you it's not GMO. Yeah. And if it doesn't tell you that, you probably should assume that it is. Yeah. Or at least, it's you know, I say it's like, uh, they can't they can't confirm that it has they not. They can't eaten. confirm or deny because it is maybe the seed yeah. drifting. Yeah. Right. Eating the corn and, the, you know, all the, all, the, all the pieces of parts. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> well, in any event, I guess I would say don't get on no, don't go on no trips. You ain't ready to deal with the consequences of. There we go. That'll be the lesson for anybody that needed one. There I have spoken. <laughs> I have whoop, spoken. Whoop, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> so on a more positive note, uh, it's Black Music Month, and I thought it'd be good if we had a couple. You know, I'll share a little bit, at least some thoughts around some 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 aspects of, of Black music, and which you know, depending on who you ask, is like. You know, it's the only music that I keep track of. Or, you know, I do, although I listen to some other stuff that might not be considered black music. I don't know. So, um, so this that that's an interesting point. I want to I want to probe a little bit into that. Yeah. So, okay, I want I want to present this right. All right. If a black person does rock, for a long time we said that it was white music, right, and then. Rightfully so, uh, music historians and folks have realized that through the means of just thinking about the development of rock and roll in America, that Black people did it first, and Mm -hmm. then it became whitewashed, right? Now, and and I haven't thought through this, so I'm really just presenting this to you, but at what point, if it started out as Black music, 
and then white people did it for a long time, and then a black person picks it up. Is it still black music? Mm-hmm. If white people do it? it? And some of them may do it well. It's kind of like a jazz conversation, right? Like, obviously, jazz is American classical music, and it is fundamentally, it was fundamentally started and done well by black people. Yeah. White people started doing it well relatively soon, <laughs> right? Like, it, it wasn't, you know, there were, we were white artists that picked it up and did it well. I acknowledge the history of jazz music, but there's also a, a conversation around at what point is it American classical music that had its origins in black music or in, in black people's lives, rather, mm-hmm. versus just still a black music? Because I, I think that, that you know, kind of a slippery slope, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I think black, it's blackity black, but I, I think that's a slippery slope. I think it's like one of those things that for me is like, it's cool to point out if it's like in the origin story, but it's okay to be like, but it, but it's like all you know, not like Debo, not like Debo watching, but like it's all of ours. You know what I'm saying? Like y'all, like if you if you're uh, what's my man? You Bob James, and you done made all these records, and we done made hip hop records out of your records, and like use as much jazz, Bob James, as you know, fill in the blank, other uh, you know, uh, black. P- pianist that 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 did jazz. You know what I'm saying? Like Bob James doesn't have to like not feel like he's a part of the world of jazz because he's not a black dude. You know what I'm saying? Or you know, just as right. like, maybe not the the smoothest example, but the first one that came to my mind. Right. I mean, you know, Gil Evans, and I mean, you, you know, there's just so many examples of like artists who, and maybe at that point, obviously, their understanding of race relations was a little different in the context of the music that they were producing because it mm-hmm. was done well in first by black people right yeah Mm -hmm. so again i get the fundamental elements of the fact that jazz started from not just a black music but the black experience it also did have other elements people should remember that yeah i mean if we're playing instruments that sometimes i mean we would say i mean some may be derived i mean because then if you start getting into where they traditional African instruments, if that makes them black. I don't know if they do or doesn't. I'm just saying, like, we want to start, you want to start spinning this out. You start getting into stuff right. that's like, okay, we're starting to get into some weird weeds here. We're starting to get to a Let weird just, place. So again, and, and, and for anyone up. listening, clearly we both understand that jazz fundamentally is a black music from the black experience. But at one point, you know, does it start to be, is black music month about black folks? <laughs> that make music <laughs> or it's about giving, you know, kind of what I'm going to call like the, the, um, Budweiser black history moment, where it's like, everything just goes back to Africa. So we might as well not talk about nothing if it ain't from Africa. Right. right like right. At, at what juncture do you start to see the nuances along with taking the history back to its source appropriately to give people credit whom often have been, who, who we have taken the credit from. Right. So clearly that's been the case because yeah. I just think about those kind of artists, um, you know, and even I, I think about drum and bass. Right. Now, a lot of black folks in America, particularly, don't understand that using the premise that we how we define black music, drum and bass is a black music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of folks may not understand that techno is a black music. That techno was created by black dudes in Detroit, right? <laughs> black women in Detroit, right? We just got to a point of people understanding that house was created by Frankie Knuckles, you know, and, and black and brown folks in Chicago. But so was drum and bass. So was dubstep. So was garage. So was so all these other elements too. These these global musics. Who if you put it, if you put it on to a person in America who didn't know any better, they would call it a white music because they heard right. that already. Right, right, or at least, or at least would say it's not black. Right, it's, it's, it's not, that not black because it's not coming we'll from do. the American lens. Yeah, it's not coming. And then you know, as I like to say, sometimes folks' personal myopic, you know, myopic myopathy. Is that the word? Like where they go, like if it's not stuff black people I know do, it's not black. <laughs> mm. <laughs> we just be like, yeah. You know, I mean, like, you don't know a, a lot of you don't right, know a lot of black people, right? You need to meet some more <laughs> black folks, like <laughs> right, you need to meet some more black people. <laughs> the black people, you know, are not sufficient. Like, I mean, they're not def- deficient; like, they're cool. 
but then they're, they're the necessary, only black but insufficient. People. Right. They're not the only <laughs> black people. There's some other black folks doing other black things, you know, or other things that are black because they're doing and, and again, and that goes to do it, right? Like, so it, you know, so that's what the one I was gonna use, like country music is another example, right? All right, now country music, the origins of it are not exclusively black. They know their folk songs, Native American music. And as well as, you know, African music, black music in America is kind of or its origin, again, is in the blues and, and, and uh, you know, from the South. Right. Mm-hmm. In the West. So it's important in the mid. Well, OK, for real quick off ramp. We call like if some shit came out of Arkansas, or Oklahoma, what do we call it? I, I think people still sort of call it the South. I think at least Arkansas. Oklahoma is probably up for debate. I think Arkansas is considered the South. Sort of. I guess here's my challenge with that. Like, that's all. I mean, it's not in the same place, but it's in similar places. But that, maybe that's a conversation for another. We're getting Alice Devon on so we could argue about <laughs> uh, where the South starts. Because right, it's, it's a fascinating conversation. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I think we get, yeah. Uh, that, I think I think Arkansas definitely is more likely in the South than like you know Missouri is where it gets tricky. You know what I'm saying? Like you know the whole St. Louis, St. Louis, the, the, you know, but, the but most then more isn't South City Oklahoma, or, the, or the South Oklahoma is, is below Missouri. Ah, well, you know, look here, man. Nobody asked you all these geography questions, brother. I know, I know. My my bad for, for the <laughs> listeners. My bad. I'm, you know, Oklahoma you was know. uh, you know, some people don't don't do they're not sure how to count Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma, yeah. You know what? <laughs> you know what? It's Oklahoma. I'm trying to think of like the example of Oklahoma. Oklahoma, remember the uh, like, oh man, like dirty rotten scoundrels back in the day with the uh, this one poured out for my homies. Before oh, we yeah. had like singing hip hop, uh-huh. <laughs> Dirty Rhymes count. It's kind of like that. Kind of like we don't know what this is. Like, like or like Domino. Like, what is this? Is, is he singing? Is he rapping? Yeah, <laughs> that's like the that's like Oklahoma. We're not quite sure what this is yet. Yeah, like it's not like because it's not the Southwest. I mean, like people sometimes will try to do like Texas is its own thing, but Texas is part of the South. You know, and then that other part of Texas is sort of like the South, the beginning of the Southwest. When you get to Texas, like El Paso. You know what I'm saying? Like, but ultimately, like the majority of what we consider Texas is the South, and therefore Arkansas has to go in. But Oklahoma is like, it's not the Midwest, kind of, because it's not the same. I mean, you know, it, even though I guess it's right next to Iowa and Nebraska. Nebraska? Yeah, right? Nebraska? No, Oklahoma's further down. Oh, Kansas. I'm thinking of Kansas. Yeah, Kansas. Kansas. See, that's what I'm, I'm saying. I'm leaving Kansas out. So see, Kansas is definitely the Midwest. Right, Kansas is definitely the Midwest. Yeah, the Oklahoma well, conversation, and I think that always gets complicated too, because as we've built on here before, the complicated history of Oklahoma. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, in, in so many ways. But anyway, okay, we'll get back on the ramp. However, yeah, back so, on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> if we have a rest stop for y'all, that was that was a a, 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 a justice and majestic mathematical rest stop part of itself. <laughs> so, <laughs> um. So I'm going to share, for me, thinking about this as Black Music Month, three of the labels slash phases of music that I've been thinking about uh, within this concept of of, of Black Music Month. Um, The first one is like, it's Philly International. And so Philly International, you know, Gambling Huff and... A really interesting, really, really interesting kind of group, uh, a phase of music, right? Because it goes everything from like Love is a Message, a, a disco song that then became uses of a breakbeat, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All the way to me and Mrs. Jones, all the way to like the OJs doing Backstabbers the Jacksons doing enjoy yourself or Teddy Pendergrass. Like mm-hmm. there's a range within gambling huff that, you know, we all like hyperbole, but like there's a range within there that the only comparable person I can compare it to is Quincy Jones. Now that might be debatable. People can give some feedback, but just thinking about a group of people who did as much music that sounds as distinct 
as they did within the R&B range, right? I mean, we, we're, we're going to call, for the sake of this conversation, we'll call all their music R&B, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so just thinking about just how much music and then also how much like socio-political stuff came out of uh, their space. You know, um, so that's like one just, again, you can't call it a genre, although you can say Philly soul and everyone knows what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, right? it's like, because yeah. I, I was, was spanning through their discogs and there's so many, you know, when you got Lou Rawls, you got uh, the OJs, you got the MS, MFSB, and which I guess is that like the band? That was like the, the session musicians. That right? was the session musicians, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then you got some other, you know, Teddy Pendergrass, Archie Bell and the Drells got a record in here. You know what I'm saying? You got, you know, Edwin Bird song got a record, got some records in here. Intruders, you know, yeah. Intruders, Phyllis Hyman, Billy Paul. I mean, you you just you're talking about a huge range of just music, and like I said, that the this small space with the Jacksons did music with gambling up, right? Like, you know, we're, you know, Hall & Oates got their start with gambling gambling up. I mean, you know, yeah, just like, think about this. Luther Vandross was singing background for David Bowie in in the Young Americans, right? They recorded at Sigma Sound in Philadelphia. Hmm. to get the sound that David Bowie wanted to mimic. Right. Like he, wanted, Philly. he wanted to get that you know, sound. Of the, of the, he wanted to get that sound, right? So you went to Sigma Sound to get that. So like, just for context, I mean, it's a huge span and just a huge breadth of music that Gamblin' Huff, um, that they did. That's one. Uh, so, okay, that's one. I'm going to go 1A here. In Tume. The reason I'm going to go with Intume is, and this is just him by himself. <laughs> His father was Jimmy Heath of the of the famous hmm. Heath brothers. He grows up, his, and his stepfather was another famous jazz musician from Philadelphia. He grows up, becomes a really famous artist, goes to uh, California does music, embraces the Us movement, which is where he gets into me as a name um, with, with Marlon Karinga, right? Mm. He comes back and then does Bitches Brew and resulting funk stuff with jazz funk stuff with Miles Davis. Mm. Okay. He goes through that phase, then he writes The Closer I Get to You for Roberta Flack. Like, you can go find versions that he did before she did the song. Heron, Downey Hathaway did the song. So he was doing that during his time with the East. Right, right. Mm-hmm. He then goes, pivots, and, and, and does Juicy Fruit. Mm. Yeah. Right? You, mean, yeah. you, you mean. me, and he. What are we gonna do, baby? Which is the is honestly along with me and Mrs. Jones probably is the best song about extra marital <laughs> relationships <laughs> that we got. <laughs> right? Like, because it also is one of the interesting songs, it doesn't center the man. Yeah. Cause a lot of extramarital songs end up centering men. Yeah. Yeah. You me and he doesn't center men. Then goes and produces the music for New York Undercover. Mm. Man. That's a lot of that's a lot of places to be touching base. It's a lot of places to be, man. <laughs> Again, the only other kind of person I could think about. It's not that he's the only person, but the only kind of others I think about in that context is someone like Quincy Jones. Mm-hmm. 
of black artists who were able to move through music in that kind of way. Like that's just a fascinating 30, 35 years of, of music. Cause if we think about a lot of like hip hop artists now who have been out and been doing music 30, 35 years. Shit, hip hop array is 31 years old. Right. Or 30 years old. Right. right. That's crazy. I mean, it's hard for me to to, to to put that all together in my head. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, you're not going to be able to do it, damn it, 30 years old. By Doug Lex Posse. Shout out to Doug Lex Posse. Shout out to Doug Lex Posse. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, it, it, oh, oh, okay. Not, I'm not going fully off the ramp here, Just. But also, it's important to think about Gangsta Bitch. Which, Gangsta Boogie. With my Gangsta Bitch. It, now, think about when that song came out, how new that was that we were hearing that kind of song. And then 30 years later, how normalized S- songs done by women that are somewhat salacious or songs that men do about women that are salacious songs about women, how mm-hmm. commonplace that is. Yeah. But 30 years ago, Gangsta Bitch was like, yeah, like, damn, like some shit you couldn't play around your parents. Right. <laughs> you got to close the door in your room and it'll yeah. be, like, be like, y'all ain't really listening, is you? Yeah, like you, you, but you just trying to get the what's the name version. Hope they don't listen to the verses. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> back on back on the ramp. Um, okay, so that's so that was one one A's. So I'll, I'll do two. The the second one, um, that for the means of this conversation, I think we've talked about it before. Um, was Teddy Riley. Uh, Teddy Riley's history, you know, the history of him being like at the top of his game, probably, you know, hadn't been as long. But, you know, I think there's not many people recently that we give the credit of like damn near creating new genres of music. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was no new Jack Swing before him. Um, but like he came up with a new genre. <laughs> of hip hop and R&B coming together in, in this kind of way, a beat that once you listen to it, even if Freddie, even if Teddy Riley didn't do it, you remember it from the time. And it sounds Teddy Riley ish. I mean, yeah. fascinating, right? Yeah. To say also nothing about the, you know, always a crazy fact that the guy in the rump shaker video ends up being Pharrell. Right. Right, the whole, <laughs> like a whole nother, a whole nother thing. <laughs> like, you know, that this guy goes down, it influences Teddy, then go, you know, uh, Pharrell and Timberland and Missy and a whole host of other stuff, right? You know, so, but yeah, just the, just the idea of the pure influence that he had in a short amount of time as a kind of musical force unto himself. Uh, someone made an interesting point I was reading. They said that the guide chain, if you remember, was kind of like the first crew chain that mattered. Oh, snap. That's hilarious. That's, I never thought about that. Like you knew that big ass guide chain and only them had or people that was with their crew. Yeah. That's funny. It's hilarious to think because you yeah before you say that I never thought about it that they was they did that and that was on the, they had them on the record label in the picture didn't they didn't they, they have them on, on the picture they had yeah. him in the picture Barry, I mean shout out to Barry Michael Cooper you know which if folks don't know about him you should know about him immediately and you go read about him as much as as fast as you humanly can he New New Jack City Sugar Hill whole host of other shit but he was a writer in the Village Voice before that. The probably the first writer to write about crack in its way that we understood it. Um, so yeah, Teddy Riley. My third one uh is Wu Tang Clan. And, and I use them, I know there's been a lot of debates about like the 
you know, best rap crew and there's a debate between Death Row and Wu-Tang. Um, but I also do think it instructive to remember what hip hop generally sounded like before, <laughs> before RZA and them, and then kind of what it sounded like after. Yeah. Yeah. And I think on a hip hop level, they probably had the best or most influential. I don't want to say best because then I'm getting the record sales. I'm not really talking about that. Yeah. They, they probably had the most influential five year run of anyone. That 93 to 97, you know, the Wu Tang forever being what it was as far as a rollout and the problems they had. But this, the influence of the music they did in that short amount of time, shifting the idea of what it meant for like a crew to be like one thing. And for one, one producer slash multiple producers, you know, cause fourth disciple, true master and others. So, you know, uh, resident produce all of it, but, yeah, so the, those were the three that I just was I was thinking about today as far as like black music and the impact um, that it had. You know, so what what are yours? So I was trying to think about you know an angle, and I, I mean it's not where I'm going because I can't remember the exact. I think it was a tweet I seen as a summer on, and it was like. Like the blackest things, like it within something musical. That, oh like, yeah, that only Michael Harry. Yeah, yeah, I think you like the clap, the, the the clap, the clap on a follow me. That like you just if you ain't been around, like you got to be. That's like a real black thing. Like when when, when the clap part comes in, because it's not in the song to tell you to clap. We start clapping because we that's part of the culture of the dance of the house music dancing and the clapping. It always be like, hey, was anybody else? So I thought that was just an interesting. Uh, like pull right to, to think about uh, like an experience within music in terms of like an experiential reality of blackness as it was as it were i would think um but i was thinking um so i was like digging through some stuff and or just scanning and trying to think of something that that always come to mind and, and i and i what i i what i like philadelphia international and how i realized my entire um orientation in music is skewed by the weight of <laughs> Philadelphia International and all of right. the sorted artists being played in my formative years. So I don't I don't know if I can effectively uh you know parse out uh like that you know if I had if I had today like you need to be fully objective justice. Like I can't like as far as I know that's how it's supposed to sound. Like <laughs> that's that's how absolutely I'm, like you know like that, that that's you supposed to sing hard, you know what I'm saying? If you want to tell somebody you love, you supposed to sing all hard, like, oh man, I came and told you. Like you gotta come in with a lot of extra bass and stuff. And you know what I'm saying? And I'm off. Then you gotta do some songs about like the factory closing and shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like times is hard out here. You're like <laughs> put the brothers gonna work it, we're gonna put it together. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that that just so that's that's one pillar. Um I went down and I went to go. But then I like I went to look at like I think of like you know labels of the last thirty years. So I was thinking I was scanning through the face records, and you know I know that some people have issues with L.A. Reid and Babyface, um, you know for various reasons. Well, the, hold I, on, hold on, break this down on the on the black tip. What's the what's, what's the issue with them? I I wasn't down with this. Well, you know some folks feel. Well, I've, I've heard some criticism that Babyface's lyrics is a little bit simple. <laughs> It could be a lot of like, girl, you know, I like you a lot. <laughs> like, like, like if you listen to them, they ain't that deep. Even if the if the performance is great, you know, which is you know not not terrible. I, I, you know, I don't know how I, I don't know how much we could criticize that. Um, and then I think the other one is just the. I mean, yeah, I guess it, I don't know if it's a. I don't know if this is reserved for the face records. Just the general reality of music labels taking stealing your money. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, well if that's the case, we can't talk about none of these people. <laughs> but I was getting through here, and it's like, you know, I mean you got Avar, you know, you got the Ushers of the world, you know, which some people may not remember that Usher is an artist back to 1993. He was like 13 or something, but you know, that's kind of crazy when you 
you put it in perspective, like he he been making records since he was like since 1993. That's a long time for however old Usher is. Uh, you got most Sierra. Kid, most kid artists don't last to still be able to go to Vegas. Oh yeah, 30, 32 years later, later. Or thirty one yeah, years later. Yeah, that's not normal. Sold out review. You know, you got the outcast, you got the, you know, I mean, you got the depending on, I mean, I'm scanning through some of these. Like you got all the stuff from the, the late 80s, so Babyface himself, the the deal after seven. You know what I'm saying? Like, but it's always, I think, interesting to think about like where it, there's a lot of records in here music that they made, I would say, in my juxtaposition to how it would think of them versus Affiliate International, I don't feel like I'm connected to any particular sound of the face. And there's probably a lot of stuff in here that's like, you know, I mean, I probably should also be fair. We was real hardcore hip hop in the in the 90s, mid 90s. There's a lot of here I probably missed because I was somewhere listening to a, you know, a whole lot of uh, something with a, doom. Right, with a heavy bass line and <laughs> You know what I'm saying? A, a low, lot of low-end theory actions. So it was probably some records in here. I'm like, I ain't never heard that. <laughs> like, I, don't, I mean, I don't but to your just... point, even the deal, which I swore that that was more Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis until I realized it. Man, I think, yeah. Because it felt like that. I mean, it wasn't. But it felt like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then they so had... To stuff. that point, in Outcast, I mean, shit. Outcast, TLC, Outcast. I mean, that's you know, they they get thrust in a history making book just cause. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know that's pretty interesting. Like, and then there's other stuff where you start scanning through the discog. I didn't know they was responsible or somehow a part of Pink in terms of just like what is basically like a pop. You know, you wouldn't consider related to a black label, but apparently, who knew? I didn't. You know, oh man, Pink. It. You know, Pink from North Philly. Yeah, I just you know, nobody, you know. Yeah, Pink Pink just didn't Pink was like a rapper and did all this kind of stuff. She just when she got the opportunity to blow, she just did her thing. But yeah, Pink from down the way. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, that's like who knew? I didn't know. Yeah, you know I mean, but uh they was in there. And then I would go as one at least I think is stand out. Uh um I would you know, uh I mean I could always go, you know. Especially after my Paisley Park experience, go. There's always Prince. That Prince sort of made all of this music. It was like seven, eight bands, but it was all Prince. But you know, they were singing too. But you know, they was you know within the atmosphere of stuff Prince was thinking. You know, so you got Prince being Prince, and then you got uh, the the time and uh, uh, what's my man name? Why can't I say his name? Uh, Who? Uh, with Do Alexander O'Neill. Alexander O'Neill a little bit, but uh the other um he was he was the antagonist in the color in um in uh purple rain. Oh Morris Day. Morris Day, yeah, Morris Day and them and the and the other singing like three, four groups that was all like Prince when he depending on what he was feeling like one night was like, I want to make a record. Sounds like this. I ain't gonna sing it, <laughs> but I'm gonna make the record. <laughs> and then somebody else gonna sing this. Is is uh, was fascinating. Um, I would say, uh, something that I guess just you know, in, in, in homage to a couple records I got to listen to when I was hanging with uh, uh, you know, a mutual elder of ours, uh, was was you know the way that like Coltrane, like he played three or four Coltrane songs that I had heard, but I had not heard, and I was like, well, that's interesting that John Coltrane did that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying from a, a jazz perspective and doing songs about the, the time of uh, you know the time of uh, kind of trying to speak to some other thoughts about the world and the time that they was in you know he played we were listening to uh, was it Alabama you know me about the four little girls oh yeah and then um, that with uh, was another joint it was like one of the it's like only one or two songs where somebody sings on a on a on a on a John Coltrane jazz record. Um, I yeah, because he's that. I mean he's doing too much for you to sing, you're trying to keep up. I mean, right. you seen the mean you know the mean where uh, David Crosby from Crosby, Stills and Nash was like the only time he was like struck 
was when he heard a train playing and like it just like stopped him in his tracks. Yeah, yeah. And that's to me, that sort of thing is fascinating because like I mean, music is it's hard to it's it's hard to play an instrument. And then it's when people get good at playing an instrument, it doesn't seem normal. Like it seems normal to them, but it seems still seems sort of magical. Like when people are good at it, because it's like, wow, man, how did you think of all that? But it is like skill based. Like you do have to like learn how to do it. And then you have to like learn how to keep doing it. And then you learn how to do other stuff that you can't do because you don't know. Because I heard people talk about me. Well, he's played three thirds and a fourth. And he's the other thing. I'll be like, yo, dog, I don't know what you're saying. Play it though. Let me listen. And I can, <laughs> you know, I can, I can get engaged in it from a performance perspective. I cannot, uh, I can't speak to those technicalities, but like I'm, in, I'm impressed by like, when other musicians are even like, I didn't even know you could do that with a with a saxophone. You know what I'm saying? And they're thrown off by the energy. And I think it's hard for us to experience though, you know, an artist like Coltrane in the way that his peers experienced him when he was doing it. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I wonder if we don't see it the same. So, you know, that's my, I don't know, one to grow on for Black Music Month. Yeah. I'm with you. I mean, I'd say otherwise too. In general, man, go out listen to some music, man. You know, life is short. Go find a song you like it and sing it. Don't miss out. And go and go listen to something maybe you haven't listened to in a minute. Go go think, listen to it again. Think through it again. Because it's easy to hear maybe how you heard it as a child, and that cuts positive or negative. Mm. Yeah. But now, go give it some other listens. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely stuff that as a kid I'd be like, man, I ain't trying to listen to this. This man, what he does it do? And now I'd be like, oh man, that was, that was heavy. <laughs> or, or, first, stuff I was like, man, this is genius. And now I'd be like, oh, that wasn't really genius. That like, wasn't that. That wasn't that good, was it? <laughs> I mean, we was just a, a gangster boogie, like, <laughs> right? Right. It's like, oh man, this person is never going to not be in hip hop. Uh, life comes at you fast. Yeah, man. Enjoy, enjoy the ride, Playboy. <laughs> So um, I don't know. Uh, it's music. Uh, so with that, I don't know. Anything else? No, I just concur, man. Go listen to some of the stuff we talked about. You know, I mean, there are other obviously towering artists and, and phases. Again, not just like our, the, the phase of the music. Um, you know, so just I do want to, we talked about a little bit earlier, but I do want to give a shout out to Music's Developed in America in the last 50 years that are not hip-hop. Again, things like Detroit Techno, New Orleans Bounce, the variations of house music, Chicago, Baltimore, Newark. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, you know, we couldn't have this conversation without talking about Go-Go. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Miami bass music. There's at least five or six other musics developed during the time hip hop was developed in America by black people. Mm-hmm. And all of them get phased into stuff, but I don't think they get the respect they deserve as musics that were and in some senses as unique as hip hop was. And, and even it's important to remember at one point, you know, Def Jam was trying to figure out how they could blow Go go up and actually did a movie about the go go street scene in DC mm. because they you know uh, what's the name from Island Records oh man oh man uh, Brant- the Branson yeah the guy that wants to fly into the moon now right mm. <laughs> um, see here we go, go- <laughs> everything comes full circle yeah <laughs> um, um, that Richard Branson after investing a lot of money in the reggae was contributing to trying to, they really saw Go-Go as the next thing. Mm-hmm. It just, you know, didn't have a front person the same way that hip hop did. And it never kind of blew up in that way. So there's other black musics developed in America by black people besides, you know, besides hip hop. So. All right. Well, so with that, I say peace. Peace. Thank you for listening to Good Brothers. Thank you to my good brother, I'm Majestic. Good Brothers is a part of the Ash Your Old Head podcast and the world of, I guess, 
this creative project. Uh, I hope these conversations are enlightening, entertaining, um, you know, do something for you to move your thought and uh, action energy in the world. Uh, we do this uh, by recording. And then since it is a creative project, uh, the best way to get it out there is for you to share and to rate and subscribe where you listen. Um, also, you can support by becoming a patron on Patreon of me creatively. Just search Justice Raji and you can add on there. You can also buy a sweatshirt on the website at ashyourohead.com or on Etsy that steals t-shirts. Yeah, still t-shirts, I think mugs, all that. You know, got to come up with some new designs, obviously, because, uh, you know, the market has spoken. Uh, any event, man, if you're still listening to this outro, uh, I just want to thank you and appreciate you for riding and sticking along for the journey. Um, more to come in the coming months and into the new year when we get there, too. So um, appreciate you and uh, be safe. Peace. Peace.